Oh, well, it's very good to be here uh, today. Um, and we're going to discuss uh, um, how to fight uh, financial economic crime. Um, and we, um, yeah, we're going to dive into uh, a couple of, uh, of issues, but we just wanted to start uh, with uh, the situation in the Ukraine and the sanctions uh, against uh, the Russian uh, uh, corporations and individuals. Um, and, and obviously, I, I wanted to know, Graham, wh what is your opinion about, uh, about the sanctions and how they are working, and is it effective? It's, I mean, it's obviously a very contentious subject, and we have a wide range of sanctions. I suppose the most eye-catching ones have been the individual ones against uh, specific individuals. And I guess of all of them, they're probably least likely to be effective. I think it hurts when somebody's prized yacht is seized in an in Italian harbour, so, so that's... You know, I get that. But I think actually in terms of managing money flows around the world, they're probably really difficult. And the reason for that is because we have such opacity in corporate structures. So the idea that people who've got billions of dollars of, you know, of however they've acquired it, money, um, haven't also got exceptionally good structures through which they can move money without necessarily revealing who they are. I actually worked on, some of you may remember the FinCEN, files, which was a big story that broke a year or so ago. And, and one of the things that came through in a lot of those SARS was how well people had hidden their identities behind corporate uh, structures and corporate identities. So I'm, I have great reservations about those sorts of sanctions. I think economic sanctions, which I'm sure we'll talk about, you know, depriving access to the financial system to Russian economic activity, far more likely to be effective. So, so the exclusion from SWIFT, for instance, is, is way more effective? Absolutely. I mean, I think you know, SWIFT is an, is an interesting case because actually it's not a method of moving money. It's a method of sending messages which allow money to effectively move, but nevertheless it will significantly disrupt the economic activity coming out of Russia. Yeah. Okay, nice. Thank you. Jeremy, what's your opinion about uh, the sanctions? Yeah, I think, I mean, I, I can probably bring this from a vendor's perspective, actually, um, I'm the CEO of Ripjar. We provide technology to financial institutions and other organizations to help protect themselves against financial crime and defend themselves against sanction risk and so on. And I think um, one of the things we've noticed, certainly over the last couple of weeks, is that the speed of new sanctions coming out from um, different governments around the world has been, you know, unprecedented and actually enabling our software and our data collection to be in front of that and on top of the game and actually deliver those sanctions to our customers you know, in a timely fashion has been absolutely critical. And working with some of our customers as they struggle to sort of accommodate this, um, this big and changing picture of the sanctions landscape has been also you know, a, a sort of a very important aspect of, of our role and our contribution, if you like, to, um, to the conflict. All right. Thank you. Yeah, so, so what I think is very interesting is that you see that in different countries, um, uh, th there's a different approach from government, from regulation, from regulators, from, supervi from, from supervisors. So, for instance, I read in the paper yesterday that in the Netherlands, uh, currently 10 million uh, euros is, is frozen, and in, Bel in Belgium, 10 billion. So that's quite a big difference. Um, could you guys, yeah, maybe touch, on, touch upon this, how this could come that two countries have such different kinds of of levels of free, the freezing of money? I mean, part of it may well be the ability to identify the money with sufficient robustness to make it worthwhile freezing, um, because clearly it's a big step. Uh, here in the UK, over the last 12 months, there's been a couple of quite high-profile cases of uh, Azeris who've had money frozen and deprived, um, 5 million in one, 13 million in another, Rather dishearteningly, there's a guy called, his name is Javan Shirfaziev, I mean, this is public domain, who's a, a member of the uh, Azerbaijani parliament, who eventually forfeited five and a half million pounds to the NCA uh, because it had been identified as having moved through suspicious structures. At the same time, he was spending 25 million pounds on two flats in Chelsea Barracks. So that, and that gives you a really good sense of how difficult this process of freezing and, and um, forfeiting funds is within the system. So uh, there's two potential reasons, I guess, friends. One is that the Belgians are being more aggressive in their application of the rules, and maybe they've also got 
ability to identify those funds rather more straightforwardly than the Netherlands, which you know, has got a bit of a history of being quite hard to delve under the, under the covers of some of the corporate structures there. So, so it's, um, I suspect it's a combination of both of those things. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks. Um, I suggest we, we move on to, to financial economic crime more broadly and, and, and really drill down to, to the problem. If, if we look at financial economic crime, what are the underlying uh, elements and issues that are, that are uh, causing this yeah, well, problem? Because I think the last 10 years, it has become, become yeah, bigger and bigger problems. If I talk about the Netherlands, a lot of the big banks got fined uh, by the Justice Department. Uh, and these fines were, were incredibly high. Um, and uh, you could say, yeah, that, that, yeah, that the banks were not really paying attention, uh, more or less. Um, so, could, could, Jeremy, could you tell something about your perspective on, on, on the problem of the financial economic crime and how it, how it came to be uh, this big? Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, again, coming from a vendor's point of view um, and not wishing to sort of speak about the particular position that some of our customers have, um, there is a, I think there is a sort of a, a difference between wanting to prevent the crime and, and actually get out there and be proactive about discovering the networks that are present within a bank's data sets and actually also just sort of stepping back and being compliant with the regulation is absolutely critical and taking those different, more proactive positions is, is really important going forwards. I think, um, I think often financial institutions can be their own worst enemy as well in terms of managing their data sets in silos and not understanding the network of risk that they actually harbor within their, you know, within their infrastructure is disappointing, I think. And you know, my background as a technologist is from the national security space. And one of the things we learned many decades ago is you can only solve those national security problems if you can bring your data sets together and ask sensible questions you know, across them all. And I think, uh, I think that is a fundamental challenge. And interestingly, the, um, the sort of coordinated world response against Ukraine and the economic sanctions that have been put in place there demonstrates that it is possible for countries to work together and actually have a, a holistic joined up response to some adversary. And it's not really any different to the sort of commonplace adversaries that we see in a money laundering operation or any other kind of uh, fraud threat, that a joined up response will always be more successful than one that is singular and you know, just copes with a certain perspective of the challenge. And, and why do you think the joined up approach is not, is not working currently for, for, the, for AML? Yeah, well, um, my, my experience of some, of some of our customers is it's not about necessarily just being joined up across different institutions. Being joined up internally is just as hard, actually, and um, the barriers that they have in place, now put it, they don't put them in place, but they have in place over many years of regulation and sort of legal compliance, if you like, are not lifted when it comes to that sort of cross-border, cross-geography sort of challenge. And um, data sharing, you know, within different geographies is a challenge in its own right, and even data sharing within an individual organization can be difficult. And I think we've seen, you know, we've seen circumstances where um, the sort of history and evolution of an organization's data infrastructure has been so fractured that they don't actually know what they've got and they don't, they don't know where the pockets of risk actually lie. And, you know, the software that we build in theory helps to sort of bring those things together. And I, I think a, a more coordinated effort is only going to help. Yeah. I think that's uh, one of the most important solutions, yeah? but, but I think we should discuss the data and afterwards the technology. Let's do that in a bit. Graham, can you sh share your, your overview about the, the financial economic problem and how yeah. it came to be that it's so, uh, yeah, so big right now? Yes, and, and I mean, my perspective is I've worked with huge numbers of journalists worldwide, um, primarily two, two organizations, the ICIJ, the, uh, the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists, and the OCCRP, the Organised Crime Corruption Reporting Project. Now, so one of the things about, and one of, what I force you to do is look at the problem from the point of view of the criminals. Now, there are two things that a criminal network will always seek to do when it wants to, when it wants to move money through the system in huge quantities. Those are complexity and geography. Those are the two things that are absolutely endemic to, to global money laundering networks. The more complex, the better. 
because the complexity makes it hard to follow the money, which is always what, what, what you're supposed to do, follow the money. And the geography makes it really hard for anyone to do anything about it because the more law enforcement agencies you've got involved, the harder it is for them to work together to address the network that Jeremy's just talking about. So that's the, that's the thing from the, from the criminal's point of view, is this complex, highly geographically diverse network. Now look at it from a bank's point of view. A bank actually faces two different types of risk. A bank faces financial crime risk, but it also faces financial crime compliance risk. And they're not the same thing, because the financial crime risk is actually protecting their bank from processing criminal funds, but the other one is protecting the bank from regulatory distress or censure. Which one of those always gets the attention of the compliance team? The regulator, because they're the ones who finds and all, does all the bad things, whereas the other one, they're happily making money out of that, you know, it's, it's not like credit risk, which is a bottom line hit. The financial crime thing is, is actually business. It's flowing through the bank and they're making money on it. So, so where do you want to focus on, well, let's not do so much business, and it's going to be quite expensive not to do that because we need the tools to do it. Or let's come do the business, but let's make sure we keep the regulator happy. So, so here you have a criminal network that's incredibly professional, highly diverse, very complex, and banks who are focused on not getting into trouble with the regulator. And it causes a perfect storm of inaction, you know, unfortunately. And, 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 and do, you, do you blame the regulator in some kind of way? Are they too strict? <laughs> I think that they're, they're using a limited tool set and others would be helpful. We are very good at criticising the bad actions. We're not so good at, at encouraging and rewarding good actions. And, and I think it's, a, it's imbalanced. So I think we need a little bit more carrot and maybe not quite so much stick. I think the stick is because there's a view the public want to see these bad bankers being smacked, and, and, and they deserve it sometimes. And, 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 and how does a carrot look like? So, I, I mean, when was the last time a regulator published a, a really detailed good practice? We've seen some fantastic things. Let's share those things we've seen. Actually, let's name the firms that we've seen doing really good things. And let's give that some publicity. Let's say there's people out there who are doing really admirable things. You should all learn from that. Because they publicise when they do bad things. Why do they not publicise the good stuff? Because you know? we need to move the mindset of the banks away from... Because it's trapping us. I'm sure we're going to talk about this. It's actually trapping us in how we develop AI tools. Because what we're trying to do is develop tools that do what we've always done in the past, frankly, badly, but, but quicker and with less cost. Yeah, but it doesn't work. <laughs> you know? So I think we need to reset the whole paradigm... And, and we need to work with regulators to do that so that we focus on excluding the, the criminal funds from the system and not avoiding getting fined. Jeremy, can you get into the AI part that Graham just mentioned and yeah. the, in relation to the regulator? Yeah, just to follow up, though, I think on some of Graham's points there, that I think the, the independence of the regulator is interesting, where they lay down some regulation and then sort of step away and let the bank interpret it, and they have very little opinion post that point, and... Uh, the sort of checks and balances that, that have to be gone through post that fact are very difficult for the organisation. And certainly, you know, when we, when we um, talk to some of our customers, and they, they take lots of different shapes and sizes, but some of them will literally just focus on the compliance risk and not on actually trying to prevent the root cause in the first place. And, you know, and, and I think sometimes that's appropriate, but other times it, it probably isn't. And having a better blend of that strategy in uh, larger organisations good. Um, then I think, um, I, I think Graham's absolutely right. We're very good, I think, as human beings at improving our solutions to problems that we're aware of. And AI is a great example of that, that it's a tool that's become more and more refined over the years that is still being smashed against the same nut. And I think we sort of need to move the, move the narrative on a little bit and start to look at the problem from different dimensions. And um, it's very easy, I think, for a data scientist to see a set of data that they have available to them as the only answer to the problem and not use their creativity and imagination, which, from my perspective, you know, are two most critical aspects of a good engineer or a good data scientist to actually think around the problem and think like the criminal. You know, Graham, Graham has spent many years... He's not a criminal, but thinking... <laughs> thinking like one, yeah. It's, 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 or it could be the best double bluff. It could be the best <laughs> double bluff, that's right. Yeah, you are the, uh, the money launderer ex extraordinaire. Um, but I think thinking like, a, thinking like um, the criminal is, is ultimately how we'll be successful in defeating them. And 
um, the distance between the data scientist and the criminal is pretty significant, right? And, um, and again, you know, re reflecting back on my days in national security, uh, your goal was always to get as close to the, the mindset of your adversary as possible and try to sweep in all the data sets that you could possibly get together and then the ones you didn't think about before, put them into the mix as well and just try and find signals in that noise. And, you know, the, the little needles in the haystack that we find today from a compliance and a financial crime perspective are literally just that. They are needles in an enormous haystack that means that we're not having the impact. That technology is not having the impact that it should have. And noting from the, the, the previous presenter's slide, the experience slide, actually, I, I saw at the top right there on adoption of AI and technology, you know, compliance and risk is actually one of the biggest adopters today. And the organizations that are picking it up are more prepared to do it, presumably because they think it's going to save them money and um, be less about the effectiveness and much more about the efficiency, doing the same things quicker with less people. And you know, that is not the right approach. You know, we have to think differently about this. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. So, that's, so there's a question underlying there. Um, what I sometimes pick up, not, <laughs> banks don't tell it to me because I work for a regulator, but um, uh, what I sometimes hear from banks is that they think uh, uh, it's not a private uh, uh, task to actually do this, to fight this, this crime. I get uh, so angry about that. <laughs> uh, so that, 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 that's an opinion that, that's with, and, and banks say, okay, uh, we have a lot of compliance officers now that are doing the transaction monitoring, that do, are doing the KYC, and there's not a revenue, uh, the revenue stream that's coming but from, from this, from this, uh, that, that, that's not my opinion. No, no, no. So don't, don't no. be mad at and me. And you can see how I, I, I think Graham wants a response, so. Uh. <laughs> but the, 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 it, yes, I do want a response because, and, I, and I, I have this conversation with banks regularly, you are making profits out of that money. You are transacting corrupt and criminal funds and you make profits on it. Of course it's your job not to handle it. You're not being a police officer. You're acting ethically and saying, as a bank, we are not going to allow corrupt politicians, organised criminal gangs, to clean their money through our bank and make a profit on it. I mean, famously, Danske Bank in Estonia, it's one of the biggest money laundering stories ever, made a profit of about 160 million euro on the money they moved out of Russia. And I think we now have a very good idea where that money emanated from. That's, that's just morally, it's not acceptable. So, so no, we're not asking them to be police officers. We're asking them to do their job properly as a bank and only be, be responsible for handling clean money. And of course they should check beforehand whether it's clean. It's not, it's not doing the police's job for them. You know? I mean, that's a bit like saying, you should never, if you see your next door neighbour's door's been smashed down, you shouldn't, that's not my job, that's the police's job. Well, no, it's not. We have a, we have a moral and, and social responsibility to, to do what's right. Yeah. So, so, so you realise yeah, I'm yeah, passionate uh, about that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, I'm not going to say anything about that because of uh, my work as a regulator, but, but I, can, I can imagine that's your position. Um, um, and that brings, brings us to the next point, I think, and that's really about data sharing. Uh, you, Jeremy, you already m mentioned it before. Um, and and what, what, what you see happening in some countries is that it's very difficult for financial institutions to, to share information with each other. And sometimes it's very difficult to have access to, to databases. Uh, for instance, public databases, um, and that, that the result is, uh, one of them is, is de-risking. Yeah? So some clients just don't get access to, to banking services anymore because they are, are in a high-risk uh, uh, yeah, high risk domain. Um, but secondly, also, KYC uh, 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 yeah, struggles with, with clients, with new clients that have to wait for weeks and fill out forms that take yeah, many, many uh, minutes, hours. Um, so what is your perspective on this, on the, on the data sharing and, and, and the burden on, on the clients with the de-risking and, and, and all the forms you have to fill out? Yeah, well, yeah, it's, it's a really interesting topic and um, steeped in all sorts of mysticism and sort of law, I think, that nobody really understands why it exists. And I think, I think from a... A, you know, my personal perspective as a user, let's say, of a mobile phone and a computer, my data is shared to you know, many, many dozens of different um, providers of the services that I'm using on a daily basis. And I have no idea, really, what people are picking up about me. And, and I think the, the sort of 
acknowledgement that some of the large tech companies are able to take our data and use it for their purposes, that if a bank had the same ability to use that similar data in, a, in, in the same sort of way in aggregate, summarized in aggregate and anonymized, sure, but if that was possible, then I think a lot of what Graham's talking about would actually be you know, that solving that problem becomes much more tractable because you have access to, to data from different geographies and different environments. And I think um, just in the last few days, you know, in, Interpol have just announced, just announced, which is interesting, uh, the formation of a, a anti-financial crime and fraud unit, um, which I mean, sort of surprised me that didn't want something like that didn't exist before, to be honest. But that that kind of police force, if you like, that has access to hundreds of other police forces around the world, should in theory facilitate some of that data sharing. And I think, but it's only part of it's only part of the solution. And the banks themselves need to be in a much better position where data can be shared appropriately. And and potentially technology can play into that as well and can help anonymize data as it crosses, crosses organization boundaries and you know, geographical borders as well. Um, but it is the only way to solve the problem is to see the picture. And at the moment, everybody sees a bit of the picture. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and what, what is your opinion about, about um, how you can actually label uh, uh, transactions that are potentially fraudulent? Uh, but you don't get the feedback from one of the authorities, uh, the FIU, for, for instance. As in sort of the one-way traffic of Exactly, exactly. Do, yeah. do you see a solution for that? Um, I think there could be a solution, and technology has clearly got a part to play in it, but I think that there is, not wishing to be negative, but there is such a sort of uh, a status quo and an inertia around performing the same job, even though it doesn't really generate the results that we all would like. Uh, it's just easier to do that than it is to change. And... Um, I know Graham has got words to say on this subject as well, but the sort of the quantity of SARS that are reported is colossal, and the, you know, the, the value that comes out of it is low. Um, that's an area that you know we're actively looking in to collaborate with UK policing as well in order to sort of make that better. Um, yeah, but I think SARS is sort of um, you know it's it's a, the, a SAR represents an analysis and a, and in theory a conclusion. Um, it still doesn't allow other organizations to take advantage of the bigger picture um, and you know, see the whole problem. Yeah. Graham, can you, can you... Yeah, so, I mean, I, again, I think we'd, we'd, we're trapped in a, in a way of thinking, which is just what we seem to be doing is trying to improve the way we're currently doing things. As an example, banks have to do transaction monitoring. Now, anyone who's ever worked in a bank will know that about 98% of all transaction monitoring alerts are false positives. And what's happening is we say, and, and I'm not decrying this, but we're seeing the development of AI, which receives those alerts, and where it's possible, auto-closes them without a human being have to, having to intervene to, to stop the massive resource costs of saying 9 out of 10 of these or 98 out of 100 are not, they're not crime. Fine, but actually wouldn't it be better to have a system that didn't generate 98% alerts in the first place? You know, so I think you know, we're attacking the problem in the wrong way. And I think the reason why we're doing it is because of this way of thinking of risk as data points. So a transaction may alert, but actually that it's not the transaction that's the risk. It's the context in which the transaction sits. And we're just very bad at doing that. And I think that's where the AI and you know, machine learning has got the potential to be massively game-changing. The problem is... I don't think humans are naturally suited to thinking in the ways that the AI can actually work because we think in data points. But risk is an emergent property. So emergent property, I mean, is... I mean, my example is always, if you take oxygen and hydrogen, which are gases, and put them together, they become water, which is a liquid. It's an emergent property. I think that's true of risk. I think risk is actually a combination of different elements that on their own not necessarily going to tell you anything important, put them together and suddenly the emergent property of risk comes out of that. People are not very good at doing that. So the challenge I think we face working in, in, in the data side and the technology and the AI and banking is how do we change our paradigms to understand how better to measure that emergent property without just doing the same thing we've already done but more efficiently and, and cheaper and with, with, with fewer resources. Because that's just, you know, it's just, it's not going to make any difference other than maybe, apologies for saying this, keeping regulators happy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, 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 do you think 
for instance, transaction monitoring should be should be centralized. Should, that there should be one institution that that's that's doing all the transaction monitoring. Cool. Sure. Yeah. Um, be great, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I think. Um, uh, I, 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 kind, I guess I kind of think that's where I'm. I've been heading with the sort of centralizing of some of these problems, even if it is at a country level, that's still much better than the, the, the individual organization's perspective today. And um, transaction monitoring is one thing, but you know, you don't really see you don't really see the risk as it flies past you. Not not the way that you can if you sit back and look at it holistically over time and you know add that temporal element in and bring in to Graham's point, all of those other contextual data points as well. And um, certainly, you know, we, we, we build networks today, and they're very large. You've got hundreds and hundreds of millions of, of entities and relationships in, in your network. Bringing that to bear in a transaction monitoring system and flowing the transaction through the context is a good way of solving the problem. I think um, expecting all transactions to be sent to a central place would be amazing. And you know that, that's exactly what we should do. Will but, we do it? But, the, but then we have to address the elephant in the room: uh, data privacy. Sure. Graham, can, can you share your thoughts on on the on the on the, yeah. the, the balance between data privacy and and fighting financial economic crime? Well, I think there's a couple of things. One is 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 about talking about the public good, and, and I'm not sure we have that as a very sensible conversation at the moment. We all get very exercised about our personal privacy, uh, but we all care about somebody stealing our life savings. So we need to understand that there is a tension between those two things. I think there's also some really interesting technologies emerging. We can talk about homomorphic encryption, so this ability to share data in a way that's entirely analysable without necessarily revealing personally identifiable information underneath. I've, I've kind of interested re uh, recently in a thing called zero-knowledge proofs. And these are fascinating Technology, I'm, I'm not going to say I've completely got my head around, but I, 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 a zero-knowledge proof, I'm sure you know this, is the ability to prove your ID without having to say anything about what your personally identifiable information. It's fascinating. Uh, again, homomorphic encryption, which is a way of encrypting data that makes it still able to be analysed without revealing the underlying personally identifiable information of identifiable information within it. I know, obviously, in the Netherlands, you have a thing called TMNL, which is the transaction money, where, where your big banks are starting to do exactly that. It's in the very early stages. That's really interesting. At least it means that, you know, if you think of it in terms of a jigsaw, we are now getting rather more than one piece of the jigsaw and a kind of an idea of what's on the lid of the box. Because you really need to know both of those things. You need more than one piece, and you need to have some idea of the picture you're looking for. Networks at scale. I mean, the answer ultimately will be the ability to analyse networks at scale. It's the only answer because that, and that was why I kind of said in the first place, because the criminals put networks at scale together multi-jurisdictionally. And until we can monitor those at scale multi-jurisdictionally, they're always going to win. Yeah. Jeremy, could you... OK, so... so AI is can help can really help us really? in the industry. It really can really help. But okay, there's a lot of opportunity there. But there's also AI risk. And um, could you share something about about your 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 perspective on these risks? So so what what you hear a lot is transparency, uh, fairness, bias. Um, and I think especially in this in this space, it's very important that you can explain. Uh, when you are, are expected, uh, 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 yeah. When you when you say to your client, okay, we think you're a terrorist, right? So so it's uh, it's very sensitive. Um, so so what is your perspective on on the AI risk side in the, in this space? Yeah, I mean, there's lots of dimensions of risk in, in in that I think. And to give you some examples, you know, we have we have hundreds of models in production today. Uh, both on customers' premises and in our premises as well, and there's a relationship between these two sets of models, and that's interesting in its own right. The fact there are hundreds adds risk both to our customers and to ourselves. That it's a it's a large weight of production um, code and capability that needs to be managed and move forwards. And I think I think there is a danger, and you know we, we're sort of trying to tackle this as we go along, but there is a danger that the more and more we become dependent on these complex models, the harder it is for us to understand, I don't mean the, sort of the explainability, but the reasons why the answers are changing over time as the data changes. And um, I mean, that is, that's something we see on a very regular basis, actually, that uh, we, we, you know, we process a lot of unstructured data and a lot of structured data, and the, 
the biases in the data change over time, mm. even if the biases in our models don't. And you know, you, you kind of have to sort of keep incrementing these things forwards continuously. Um, so I think there's, there's definitely a whole, a whole heap of risk there. And I think one thing that people don't talk about as well is that they often talk about a, an AI model in the singular. And in my experience, you know, we have chains and chains and chains of these things that go one after the other in order to produce some sort of outcome that a human can make a decision on. And um, there is a tendency, certainly from um, sort of our colleagues and the regulators, is to focus on individual models and not actually necessarily understand the end-to-end -end chain and the impact of it, um, which is, in, you know, from a, from a, again, from a supplier and a vendor point of view, is hard for us because actually building, um, you know, build, building, if you like, a, a complex explanation of an end-to-end -end sophisticated engine is really hard and consumes an awful lot of our time and it's very, very difficult to do and it needs to be updated every time you make a change to the model. And, you know, the, the sort of the, the danger of adding more and more bureaucracy around model management means that actually the models don't change, the data does, and you end up with the wrong answers anyway. And, you know, so do, I do, do, do you think we can we can use models in this in this space that are uh, uh, not explainable or not completely explainable? Yes. How? Because 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 um, uh, the dilemma I see right now is if in this space, if you say okay for transaction monitoring we are to going to use a model that's completely transparent, then for criminals it's obviously obviously very easy to to bypass the the the, the things that you test in the model that you the, the variables that you use in the model, right? Um, so can you share something about this about, about about how a model doesn't have to be explainable and and uh, also your ideas around uh, uh, the, the, that transparency is not always good? Yeah. So certainly in the, 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 the tooling that we provide to uh, our banks and other financial institutions, um, we allow the human to ultimately make a final decision. And I think that's not always appropriate, but it, you know, with our software it is. And I think having that person in the loop that can actually arbitrate over any decisions that a model might have made is sort of is pretty important. You know, certainly up until the point where um, you know that the human is agreeing with the, the output of these things, right? And, and so I think the whole sort of um, AI is going to replace uh, people piece is actually probably not as, not as true as some might think, where I see a big place for the human being in the, in the machine, if you like, and part of that cog in the machine. Um, so I, I am a believer that we can get away without explaining models. It make, makes my life an awful lot easier as well if we can do that. <laughs> Graeme, can, can you share your thoughts on the, on the man-machine interaction? Uh, yeah, I think here? it's quite interesting that we, we, we have a problem with, with models that can't be explained, but we're, we're quite comfortable with humans who can come to a decision which they can't explain. And, and, and that's an interesting paradigm. because It's the same with bias, I think. It, it, it's exactly <laughs> the same. There's the, there's the start of, of, um, of the, the book Tipping Point, um, I can't think of his name now. I wrote it, but it'll come to me. Where, where they were agonising over a, over a uh, Malcolm a, a, Gladwell. Malcolm Gladwell. Thank you. And they were agonising over a, a, an Egyptian artefact, whether it was a, a fake or real. And all sorts of experts had done tests on that, and they eventually said, "No, we think it's real." And the chap walked into the room and just said, "Oh, it's fake," instantly. And 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 it was believed, you know. But probably couldn't explain it. He said, "I just know it's a fake." That's based on my ten thousand hours and several years of experience, whatever. So I think. You know, I, I think we have a we have this kind of human nervousness of a machine being able to do that, but we fully accept our own ability to, to do it. Um, I think there's some uh, another we haven't talked about, but another emerging technology which it will definitely work hand in hand with with AI and others is synthetic data. We've talked about mm -hmm. synthetic data. I think is quite exciting, and people say, "Oh, fake data." No, it's not fake data. <laughs> this is data that doesn't contain any particularly personal information, but absolutely mirrors the reality of what's going on. And the great thing about that is it, it, it will allow us to test a lot of these models without exposing... I mean, the bank is really nervous about putting its real data through something like that because it may discover horrendous stuff it's been doing for years that hitherto has remained hidden. It, it, actually, in America, they say, look, if you do that, you get forgiven it. But, but we haven't adopted that. Synthetic data, of course, isn't quite the same because you can test the destruction in your control environment, but you're not actually saying anything about your own data. You're just saying this data, which replicates reality, is showing there's some areas that we need to improve. I think that's quite exciting. It's very much in its infancy, but I do think synthetic data working with you know, some of the AI and deep learning tools, homomorphic encryption, all of these different... So what am I saying? I don't think anyone's got the whole 
answer. I think there are going to be networks of answers which together, taking a lot of this new stuff, will, will totally change the game. And I think actually ultimately the AI will change the way we think about risk rather than us changing the AI. I think we will learn as much from the machines as the machines learn from us. Yeah. That's very interesting, yeah. But I'm old enough not to worry about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think the synth synthetic data uh, you mentioned is very, very interesting. And it can really help us with privacy issues, also with the data privacy regulator. That's very, in the Netherlands, they are very concerned uh, about privacy issues in fighting financial economic crime. And I understand this, but there's, like you never mentioned before, Graham, there's always a balance, right? Because there's... Yeah, there are also things going on in crime that, 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 that we just don't want as a, as a society. Um, last question before we go to the Q&A um, is, is, is more focused on KYC. Um, and, and Graham, I think you, you, you already sort of mentioned it, and, and that's the digital ID. Yep. Um, so so um, what are your opinions about the digital ID? Should, should we use it? And obviously there are... Uh, in relation to, to the coronavirus, a lot of yep. people thought with the QR code and we are b being surveilled in a surveillance, sta surveil surveillance state and stuff like that. So yep. uh, it's, it's quite sensitive right now. But well, it is. Well, as I said, it's amazing how people suddenly don't care so much about that when they've just had someone steal their life savings. Uh, it, it, it is, it is you know, contextually important. We've got it, again, I'm sorry to say, I think we've got it all wrong. I get rid of, I mean, you must have this. When the bank rings you on your phone and says, oh, it's the bank here, I just need to take you through security. Why the hell do you need to take me through security? You rang me. Why, why, you've rang me on the number that you have and I've answered it and said it's me. Why do you need to take me through security? I've had the same conversation. It's yeah. ridiculous. <laughs> I should be taking you through security, you know? Because <laughs> you've rung me and I don't know who you are. Well, we... we, we we put up with this. I don't really know why we do it. Well, I don't. I hang off, I, <laughs> I, I say, no, sorry. Um, if I need to go through security, when you've rung me, I'm just not interested, you know, because it's not my job to tell you who I am when I don't know who you are. So that's all. So when, I think, actually, the whole biometric ID thing is, is fantastic because it's a far more... I mean, I work, I've worked in KYC. I, my main area is, is companies' house. I, I do, you know, I'm I kind of... That's, my world is... You, you can incorporate a company in the UK with, with no verification whatsoever. You have to provide more information to get a library ticket than you do to start a company. However, if somebody uses your name as a director or, or worse, as a person with significant control of a company, you then have to provide ID to have it removed, which is kind of like anyone can walk into your house, but you're not allowed to leave it until you prove it's your house. <laughs> It's bonkers. Biometric ID, digital ID is actually a far more secure and far less friction involved than all of that stupid paperwork. I mean, uh, and anyway, Companies House is bonkers because the banks would happily pay for Companies House to do the ID because then it would be a golden source of ID for people who are being onboarded into the bank. So we've just got the conversation wrong. I don't know why we don't have a central repository of our own data, which you could then permission the banks to access, yeah. which you then control. Uh, Jeremy, do you have a, a technological perspective? Is, is it, uh, from a technological perspective, how would you organize the digital ID? Yeah, I guess, well, just, just sort of picking up on Graham's points there, it seems to me the longer the relationship you have with the bank, the less well they know you. As you move house, you know, as your relationship status changes, the last thing you think of is telling the bank that you just got married and this is the person, you know, and if they don't come out to you to find that information out, they're not going to know. And so the, I think that sort of drift of quality of KYC data is interesting and unless you choose to go to the bank they're just not going to know which I guess speaks to some sort of central um, ID scheme and, and it is interesting again around the willingness of people to share this information and my I mean as an example my, my wife was rang up by our bank a few months ago and there had been a fraudulent transaction on our account and the last thing that went through her head was, oh, my gosh, you know my name. You know, there is a privacy concern here. You don't, you don't want to think that, and it isn't, it isn't in the forefront of anybody's minds. And I think the, just touching on privacy again, you know, just the sort of um, the benefits that we get as a society by sharing some element of our identifying information just far outweighs the disadvantages especially when you consider we give all this information to Google anyway. And if we wanted to create a digital ID, the first thing I do is speak to them, quite frankly. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, sh and should it be decentralized? Um, should it be decentralized? I, I don't, 
Well, mm, that's really interesting. I mean, about 15 years or so ago, I did wonder if it was a startup idea, actually, to sort of create that, create that sort of decentralized technology that would allow identities to be managed. And um, I chose a different path, clearly, and I'm sat here today. But uh, I, I suspect it would have to be decentralized for it to work, which might introduce you know, some of the emerging technologies and the blockchain and so on and other, other sorts of ways of managing that decentralized ID. However, at the same time, I don't think it will work without government intervention and you know Ooh. the state playing a part in it as well. So it's a bit of a bit of a it's hybrid, both. really. Hybrid. Yeah. Graham, you want to, to, to add a, a little bit about accessibility because um, one of the things about digital ID and particularly biometric ID, my wife is profoundly dyslexic, and for most of her life that has caused her to have an inability to interact with with um, digital media. She now has an iPhone and a computer which work on facial recognition. Changed her life. Utterly changed her life because she can't do a password. That's not, it's not, she doesn't have functional reading or writing. She's incredibly brilliant, but she doesn't have functional reading or writing. So there are, I think there are also other benefits from biometrics because, because the whole basis of a world built on passwords that you type in actually is quite ex exclusive. And biometric is, is completely inclusive because everyone has biometric data. Yeah. You know, so I think it's, it is easy to forget that it isn't just about privacy and security and all the other things. It is actually about, it's about inclusivity and access. <coughs> and people in the world who are, who are functionally illiterate can still be brought into that, into that global framework through biometric identity. So I think it's an absolute must. Okay. Well, thanks a lot. Um, I think we need to stop uh, for the, for the Q&A. Um, but, but first, do, is there anything else you want to, to say that we didn't speak about already? Well, yeah, loads, but I'm not going to. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't expect otherwise. But. Let's open the floor for Q&A. Yeah. Hi, uh, thank you guys so much for this very interesting, engaging discussion. Uh, I'm a data scientist at NetWest, and our, our team actually uh, deal with financial crime uh, models a lot. We, I actually help a lot to build a transaction monitoring machine learning model, so I can relate to a lot of things that you guys just talk about. So a lot of things, good information, I'm going to feed back to my team when I go back, so thank you for that. Uh, I think my main question is like um, before I start working at the banking industry, before I was a data scientist, I always saw some news about, oh, top tier banks got fined and money laundry, all those things. And my initial reaction back then was like, how could you not stop it? <laughs> it's like banks, you guys are powerful, you have money, you have all the resources and people, I thought, when I was younger, very naive, <laughs> which is like, we're able to do that, we are able to fight that. Um, but especially after I started working in this domain, I really found the difficulty of doing so. Um, it's kind of like, especially like right now, the criminals are become smarter and smarter. Um, it's like for banks in general, we kind of always add this disadvantage area of because we are, we are under so much constraints, we're such big organizations, it's, harder for us to make changes immediately versus criminals, they are totally agile. They can come up with really creative way of like trying to beat us. So it's, I kind of always feel like we are at like a disadvantage part. Do you guys think that's true or if there are actually ways to make us kind of like beat them <laughs> to some degree uh, in the near future? Thanks. Are we allowed to mention Fowler Oldfield? Is that, is that? <laughs> um, for those who don't know, Fowler Oldfield was a customer of NetWest who managed to put 365 million quid through their account, 260 million in cash. That's no, no nothing personal. But, um, it, it, and, and the transaction monitoring didn't work, and I'm, you know you probably know that, and it didn't work because at the time. NetWest treated cash and checks as the same thing, so they didn't realise the cash was going through the account, even though uh, it's, it's a long story. Um, all I would say is the most effective thing, I, I work with lots of banks, including NetWest to a degree. One of the most in helpful things that I think I've ever done is to organise a workshop and get people in a room, stakeholders, and for a day ask them to be criminals. So stop focusing on your controls. For a day, let's all work together. And if we had 
300 million pounds, we wanted to launder it through NatWest, how would you do it? Because then they focus on the gaps. Then you think like, a, as Jeremy just said, think like a criminal. You know, we've got to stop thinking about regulation. We've got to start thinking about where are the gaps in the regulation. You would be astonished how good your people are at working out how to launder money through your own bank. And that way, you find out how to be agile about plugging those gaps before other people find them. So that would be my vote. Organise workshops to, 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 to launder money. Don't do it. Obviously. So basically, it's, it's what you see in cybersecurity, right? With absolutely. ethical hackers. It's white, it's white, white hat. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah. It's white hatting for, for, for money laundering. Yeah. 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 Interesting. Is that good? <laughs> Other questions? Hi. Uh, so, do you have some experience in how you make your your financial crime, crime models not forget old fraud schemes. So my, my experience, you, you train your model on a short period of data, and you find a scheme, and you are really fast to block it. And then criminals see this doesn't work anymore. And you retrain your model and your model, and this doesn't occur anymore. And half a year later, the same scheme pops up again and again and again and again. So do you have some way to make your models more sustainability, more sustainability? Yeah, I, if I pick that one. So um, no is the answer. <laughs> um, there's, no, there's no silver bullet, is there? I think there is, there is practicalities you can put around it. And we have, you know, we have a set of processes that we go through where we try to, try to train our models again on a regular basis using the data we originally used and any new input that we might have had recently. And if you can do that every three months, then you're kind of keeping on top of the game. And then once every 12 months, do a proper refresh of everything. And uh, we, we're in a bit of an unfortunate position where we've got over a petabyte of data that we need to reprocess when we make a significant change. And that's computationally expensive, costly, and all the rest of it. And um, and again, sort of harking back to the model validation can result in a bit of a skew from where you started to where you end up, which just raises questions in our customers' minds that, you know, our, our risk posture has dramatically changed, which isn't the case. It has changed, and, um, but it's, it's hard to sort of accommodate that. And I think, I think you're right, sort of changing um, methodologies and MOs that the criminals have great if you can pick them up, but you really shouldn't forget them, you know. And, but then, you know, I suppose to sort of Graham's point, Graham's the ultimate sort of crime fighter, and he's got a fallible memory as well, right? <laughs> Sorry, who are you? <laughs> <laughs> I think, can I just chuck? Yeah, go ahead. One of the other things I'm interested in is, is what I call green flagging, which is at the moment most of what we do is red flagging. We look for the, for the outliers, but actually what about labelling data that we know full well is good data? And, and, and build up a library of stuff that we know is okay. Because that way, I think that's probably more adaptable to changing um, typologies and methodologies but by saying, look, this is okay. We, we, can, we just know that's okay. It fits entirely with our customer profile. Because per se, anything which is fraudulent or money laundering has to be an outlier. That has to be. So, Because if it fits with the customer's profile, you're never going to find it, ever. So, so, so green label, use green labeling. It may be computationally a bit more... You know, but I think actually over time it's probably likely to be more efficient than always trying to find the outliers. Because you know, you're looking for a signal against a lot of background noise. Well, why don't you label all the background noise so it's not noise anymore? It is actually useful data. And that way you've got a much easier, I think, a much more straightforward chance of, of identifying changes in the signal. Jeremy, is it possible to, to put a, a green flag as a rule in the model? Yeah. I mean, we do, or not feed that model into it at all and identify it out of band and, you know, sort of restrict what you're feeding through your model in terms of finding the risk. And I think, I think, you know, as soon as we start talking about those two binary choices, though, you start to get into the age-old debate of, you know, false positives versus whatever, true positives, and, and what is the right balance and the right ratio, which is basically a work and an effort and a cost equation that a bank goes through. And I can't, you know, you can't blame them for having that perspective um, and we go through you know we go through pretty rigorous and lengthy tuning exercises for our models as well so a model's got to be 
baseline to some level of performance and then taken into an organization and made fit for purpose for them. And you know, that, that, that's how we do it today. It doesn't feel to me, though, it is, it's not the answer for the future because it does require human intervention and you're mm -hmm. constantly having to go there and sort of improve things. Um, green labeling data, yeah, I think is good. Um, I think it's, it suffers from the same problem as the finding the red flags, of course, though, that, that somebody who's good today might be bad tomorrow as well, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. And, that, and that actually picks up on the KYC thing, which is where we started. At the moment, banks do KYC really poorly, if I'm honest. Um, one of the things they tend not to know is, is there's a question at opening the account, which is the nature and the purpose of the account. Uh, and they don't do it very comprehensively. I, I was once sitting in the boardroom of a, of a well-known bank, I said, can I ask a question? He said, yeah. He said, has anyone out of interest ever walked in to open an account? And when you said, what are you going to use the account for? said, I'm a career criminal. I'm going to use the account to launder money. And they looked at me like I was, and I said, well, no, of course not. I said, no, and they never will. And that's the point, is that KYC, the idea that KYC is a control is ridiculous because really sophisticated criminals will always provide you with KYC. The point here is the more comprehensive it is, the more they have to lie. And the more lies they tell you at the outset, the easier it is to red flag, green flag, because the, the, di the divergence between what they said and what they're now doing, either something's changed and you need to refresh the KYC, or they are doing something they should not be doing. But most, most systems don't even connect the KYC to the transaction monitoring. Um, and when they do, the KYC, what's the purpose of the account? Normal business activity. I mean, you want to give up at that point. Yeah. I mean, what, that's meaningless, you know? Yeah. Interesting. I think, I think the blend as well between sort of what we consider to be traditional financial crime, if you like, and cybercrime, and the, the kind of crossover between the two means that things like account takeover means that a perfectly normal green flagged account that had a certain behavior on day one will change and yeah. you know, is used for some other purpose. And yeah. spotting those anomalies is, is clearly critical in that. And, and in, in near real time, because uh, otherwise so it's a waste of time. Can, yeah. Yeah. Uh, one more question. OK, we've time for one more question. Yeah. Um, should we be concerned that sophisticated uh, criminals might use deep fake technology to defeat uh, biometric authentication? Yeah. I was in, so I'm sure you'll have a view, but just to, I was in Birmingham a few weeks ago at the Solicitors Regulatory Authority um, annual conference and one of the things I did a bit on was deep fakes and th there are actually some great websites that you can go and train yourself to recognize deep fakes and I can't remember what they're called now but they're really good because there's still currently there are ways of uh, one of them's eyes because the eyes are always looking straight ahead and, and an artifact but but it's we're, we're probably not training people on recognizing deep fakes yet there's some really good technology there's one I can't remember but it flashes so when you do your selfie you get these amazing flashing lights and, and it has yet to be defeated so, so it, there's some good stuff out there, but you had no deep faking. Obviously, Zelensky, would they tried to deep fake um, yesterday. It was rubbish, but, it, but it's an indicator that it will get better, and we need to be thinking now about how we're going to deal with it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it makes you put your head in your hands, doesn't it? Yeah. Really, I think. <laughs> it's just not one more thing. And um, I guess the, the, the difference, perhaps, with things like deep fakes is technology is the perfect weapon against a technologically generated problem in the first place. So, um, yeah, I mean, that gives me some hope. Yeah. Can you backwards engineer a, a, a generative adversarial network? No, well, we, we don't do that. <laughs> no. <laughs> OK. Maybe in the future. Yeah. <laughs> next, next company. <laughs> all right. Um, thank you all for listening today. And enjoy lunch. <laughs>